Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the CTSC webinar for August 28, 2017. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. CTSC is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about CTSC can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Stronger Security for Password Authentication with Stanislav Yaretsky. Uh, before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, the presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box in the Adobe Connect window. You type questions there. And uh, we allot for time at the end of the presentation for questions as well. And with that, I will hand the microphone over to Stanislav. Stanislav, welcome. Oh, thank you, Jeanette. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, good morning. Uh, so I will be uh, uh, talking about, I was invited to speak on um, our various projects on uh, password authentication. So, and, and two-factor uh, authentication scheme. So, Physically, uh, is password insecurity inevitable? Uh, or, in other words, how to strengthen password authentication? That's what we, uh, that's what our work is aimed for. And uh, I'm at UC Irvine, and this will be uh, a talk based on joint works with uh, Hugo Kraftchuk at IBM Research, Nitesh Saxena and Maliha Shinvanian, who are at the uh, University of Alabama, and uh, there are co-PIs on our grant uh, that uh, with CI, uh, uh, CI. and um, Adilov Kiyas is at the University of Edinburgh, Edinburgh, and Jauk Xu is um, as my student at UC Irvine. Uh, so, passwords are the main authentication tool uh, today on the web, and uh, they protect our lives and social order. They are very convenient, and they are insecure. Uh, so millions of LinkedIn passwords leak, uh, Adobe hacked, uh, more uh, 50 million, 30 million accounts, uh, I, you know, the academic website, uh, IEEE, for you know, God's sake, is uh, hacked as well, uh, shame on us, Dropbox, uh, and, and billions and billions, right? So, um, uh, the uh, Yahoo with like one billion user accounts, right? And more and more and more. And um, there was even a website called leakedsource.com that you know professed to do the good thing uh, by uh, publicizing like a huge uh, databases of um, account names and passwords. Uh, collected from, um, yeah, I guess you should, you should call it a dark web. Uh, this was obviously what, so that people can check that their stuff was hacked, that their username, uh, you know, and password is leaked, and so they can change it. This is of course controversial because not really if it helps attackers or or, or the public, so it was removed. But it's a it's a testament to the to the problem. Um, so this is really an unacceptable state of affairs, and uh, do we have any choice, right? So, um, you know, getting rid of passwords does not seem to be realistic. There were, you know, there's many uh, worthwhile um, uh, attempts at doing so, graphical passwords, biometric, but yet passwords are so convenient and massively deployed that it, it seems like we, we, we will be stuck with them and uh, if uh, you cannot ask users to memorize a uh, high-end copy password that on top of it will be independent from service to service, and, um, and attempts to force users to, to, to uh, choose, to choose high-quality passwords and to uh, rotate passwords are basically like shooting yourself in the foot. Because users cannot remember those, so they basically you 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 um, you scale down to the security of email uh, because they ask to refresh passwords every time they authenticate. 
So uh, cryptography can help. Okay, and uh, it's not the, it's our work does not suffice. So you have to also um, change systems out there. But first, you you have to have a cryptographic foundation, and 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 uh, we show that it's feasible and it's low cost to do so. Um, and uh, the the techniques are not very uh, complex. This is not uh, you know does not require uh, creating like fully homomorphic encryption scheme or uh, non-interactive uh, you know uh, secure computation. It's it's standard stuff. Um, <clears throat> just engineers and analyze uh, um, uh, to make sure that it it it, it works. Uh, is this ready for deployment in some sense? Um, we, I'll go over three solutions in this talk. And uh, I very much uh, ask uh, for everyone for feedback. If you are interested to learn more, uh, if you can see what we can improve, uh, you know, if we overlook some uh, problems that come up in practice that, uh, that would make this stuff um, problematic or we can make this better suited to uh, what 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 um, you know what is uh, the, the the real as um, as practitioners um, as see it. So uh, I'm I'm very open and encourage you to contact us. Um, okay. So what are the main sources of insecurity of passwords? So I would say that the first one, uh, all this uh, animation uh, at the very beginning about hacked website and millions or billion in the case of um, Yahoo uh, accounts uh, and uh, passwords leaked is so-called offline dictionary attack, which is uh, possible uh, when somebody corrupts the web service who holds password files for all its users. Okay. It's the main source of password compromise. It's the deadly combination of the fact that we have limited, our memory cannot memorize high entropy secrets, that our passwords are by nature low entropy, and the fact that uh, servers, web servers, do get hacked. Okay, that software is not perfect, systems are not perfect, and, and systems are hacked. Um, so what happens when when a, when a web server uh, when that web server storage becomes uh, adversary gets a hold of it is that he gets a password file uh, which means hashes of passwords and what he does with this is that uh, that the attacker is going to go over dictionary English French Chinese whatever because it doesn't really matter that there is you know hundred languages spoken on this planet. Um, it, for every word in the dictionary, it's going to hash and check whether it matches the hashed password on the uh, in the database file. And so, and it can pre you know prepend a digit, append a digit, append two digits, prepend some exclamation mark, and on and on. And it's not going to find every password, but that's okay if it finds half of the billion among you know, Yahoo database, right? Uh, so it, you even have like dedicated hardware to do this. Um, it's really hard to, to, to defend uh, against this. And, and in a sense, they're unavoidable. These attacks are unavoidable because if the server has a way, you know, if the whole, think of the whole password authentication protocol as, a, as, a, as some algorithm. It clearly, the input to the algorithm is the password. And on the server side, whatever server has, it has to decide yes or no. So whatever that code is, adversary can run it if he has the server state. So server state is some function of the password, and therefore it can be can be recomputed and checked. And, um, there is a common line of defense against that. It's called salting. But what it is, is just something that slows it down and does not eliminate it, right? So salting a password means that what you're hashing is not password itself, 
but password comma a long random salt value that you store next to the this hash right what it does is that when adversary corrupts all of the stuff he has to test every password separately for each account because he has to tag this hash function with a salt stored for a given user right so it does slow him down but as many um, uh, you know as practice shows it does not slow them down adequately and also there are papers that show that um, you know computing the stuff um, is not a problem for the for the adversary right it, it's better than not sorting but it, it doesn't solve the problem so okay how can we render this unavoidable exhaustive search attack uh, ineffective okay well if we uh, we can so the idea is that we can force these and passwords to be high entropy if we have additional keys in the system okay and where do we get the key additional devices or servers now what devices well a cell phone okay a USB stick obviously right so if well, people knew this if you if you have a key on a USB stick stick it in your computer if you have it connected and if uh, you know your browser is supported with some browser extension you can um, you can now you know you can you can um, create stronger stronger translate your um, password into into strong uh, cryptographic string uh, what we show is that you can do the same with a cell phone and and this stuff is already used in two-factor authentication scheme um, many uh, services already adopted the, the the method the the, gen, the general idea of for authentication not the particular cryptography that we propose and when we say service what do we mean well it could really be hosted by any cloud service and um, it could be done in two different ways uh, that are sort of independent one is that end users could use these servers in a way that makes the whole thing transparent to the web service and uh, <clears throat> a mirror flip of this is that the web server can do it behind, you know, under the hood in a way that is fully transparent to the end users. So there's two paths to adoption. The users can adopt it on their end, and they don't need the server uh, participation or even awareness that they are strengthening their passwords in this way. And the web servers can do it on their end, and the users don't have to be aware of this. Right. There's nothing wrong with the parties being aware, but, but it basically means that adoption can, can go uh, in two different paths independently. Um, oops. Uh, now I lost the screen. I'll bring it back one second. Uh, sorry, everyone. Um, That's okay. Okay. Here we Thank are. You, um, yeah. Um, okay, so here is the outline of uh, the rest of the talk. I will try to uh, present one such uh, scheme that, that strengthens uh, password authentication. We call it Sphinx. Uh, it's based on uh, two papers um, with Hugo Kraftek, uh, Nikos Saxena, and uh, Maria Zinivastan. And uh, there's an extension to two-factor of authentication of that uh, that I want to signal and um, and uh, the, also I want to show how this generalizes so uh, basically a password store uh, using something we call password to secret sharing that in a, in a line of work we showed uh, can be done much more in a much more practical way than was uh, um, known before and if time allows uh, uh, another example of an ongoing of a sort of new work on um, on uh, making um, a PKI um, uh, oblivious um, uh, password authentication a privacy sorted in an efficient way. Okay, so let's get down to it. Um, so the the, the 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 part I want to focus on is um, uh, how to. Uh, build in uh, resilience in these offline dictionary attacks to password authentication. Uh, 
by this idea that you can map uh, low entropy passwords to full entropy uh, cryptographic strings using uh, um, auxiliary either device or security service. And we call it a password store. Uh, so what's a password store? Okay, so it's a simple solution to password errors. So in, you know, imagine that you have a solution so that you can carry strong independent passwords for all the services you use. You know, your hospital, your bank, your, your, uh, your mail, your uh, anything. And that it's somehow stored in a way that perhaps on your phone, perhaps on a smartphone, perhaps online, uh, but it's encrypted under a master password. So in order to get to it, you do have to have some password, right? Hopefully non-trivial. Uh, but you will not use it. You will only use it to retrieve these um, pseudo-random, cryptographically strong um, secondary password, if you will, and and you will use those to authenticate. So nobody gets a hold of your of your master password. Okay, could you could you do that? So that would be a password store. Uh, I I lost it again. I don't know whether that happened. Uh, um, to, um, Bringing it up okay, now. Now yep. we we we're back. Thank you. Okay. So how could you you know um, now? <clears throat> uh, password. So password store. Typically, um, the way it's it's implemented is that well, it's all those passwords are sitting somewhere encrypted under the master password. Where well like many uh, you know uh, commercial solutions that will send it to you they basically encrypt um all your um all your passwords under the master password that they store in a browser extension so if your uh, laptop is compromised and uh, and uh, attacker gets a hold of that list well he does the offline attack against this master password to decrypt all these individual passwords and then uh, use them to authenticate. Um, another thing is that uh, that you know a keylogger or any uh, access malware on your on your client can also will 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 get ahead of this. And um, uh, yes, yeah, so um, so can we do better? Okay, and, and and also another another problem with this is that it's um, you know if you try to wherever you try to hide, keep this list, you want to make it unavailable to attackers. So typically, sit for example, you know um, it's married to your computer, right? Like if you use some other computer, well, good luck. Um, uh, or it is uh, cached on. Uh, basically, that's the company that provides the service, right? And that's why you can you can run it from a different computer because you log on to the service, it gets uh, it gets it gets retrieved from there. Well, that's a single place of failure again. Whoever corrupts that service is now uh, going to get a hold of all these passwords. So, can we do better? Uh, well, the dream password store would keep. Um, it uh, on either user's device or online. Uh, and um, why is it okay to keep it online? Well, because, I'm sorry, because if you authenticate, you assume data connectivity. Okay, so you might involve other web services in this, in this procedure. And you would like all these passwords to be random, independent of each other, the, uh, and the user to, pro to memorize just a single password. Um, and um, you know, we want uh, the system to be secure, even if this device or service is completely compromised. Okay, which is counterintuitive. Like, how come the service can help strengthen? the password translate from the master password to all these individual um, secure uh, passwords 
and yet corruption of that service is somehow not leaking uh, either the master secret or those uh, uh, resulting passwords, right? Um, so what do we mean that it, it, it might leak nothing? Well, actually, it's information theoretic nothing. So this, the information that the device keeps, okay, some keys are independent of either the master password or the individual resulting password. So, uh, and it is so even if adversary corrupts the device and has full control of it, and uh, by extension, as the adversary on the line between you and this device or service. Uh, 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 will learn nothing as well, okay? So uh, intuitively, it is a form of secret sharing that we're going to employ, okay? Between the master password and whatever keys the service keeps for you. And uh, out of the two, you can compute what the individual passwords will be, but the device key by itself um, uh, does, not, does not help, okay? So um, we call it Sphinx for, you know, acronymizing kind of the password store that perfectly hides from itself, and this is no, no exaggeration. Uh, uh, Sphinx, so okay, so, so let me show you uh, uh, one, one solution uh, based on a particular instantiation of the cryptographic primitives, in particular uh, crypto. Okay. So here is the outline of the solution. It's based on something called two random functions, okay? And uh, imagine the system works like this. The, this um, on the left, we have this device, and I'm going to picture it as a, as a, as a cell phone that has a key. I call it KD, a device key. The user types a password on his client, uh, 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 and uh, the password somehow is communicated to the device. This is not really... Uh, how it's going to happen, so I put a little question, because that would be actually insecure, right, that you just send the password into the, into the, um, onto the link uh, to some outside device. Uh, you don't know who you talk to, right? Uh, but somehow you do that using crypto magic, and the response, what, what you're going to compute of this is the pseudonym function ta uh, keyed by the device key on this password. And the value, the output of this random password, I call randomized word, RWD. And that will be the password that we'll use with some um, server, okay? Uh, so the, to, in order to separate between servers, well, it's not going to be password. By itself, it's going to be password and some uh, unique domain name of the service, okay? So that we separate. Uh, between uh, password, uh, randomized passwords that are um, um, uh, used for different services, right? So, pseudorandom function is a cryptographic object, and it's no, no more. Compl it's basically a model for a, what a block cipher does. That uh, under the same key, if you compute it on different strings, so even if you use the same password with several servers and they differ, therefore by domain name. Well, you computed the PRF on different input, and therefore the output is like completely, it's a uncorrelatable by any efficient algorithm. So if some efficient algorithm manages to find correlation between these function outputs, they break the cipher. Okay. And um, the beauty and generality of this is that it actually works with any password protocol because this uh, slow tapped by Number five, well, that's not really that the client sends password to the server. Client initiates any password authentication protocol under this randomized password. So using the standard uh, today, that means establishing a TLS session and sending that string um, uh, under this um, the TLS uh, security. But it could be um, other authentication stronger than this. Um, so um, because of the properties of pseudorandom function, the, these random, randomized passwords that services see are, um, they look like random strings. So an offline attack is invisible. The storage has a pseudorandom key 
So it does not know anything about the master password. And so cannot, you know, he can do online attacks, like trying to create these um, uh, passwords under the various strings. Uh, but online attacks are, you know, are much less of a problem. So in here, in this simplified picture, there is obvious bug. Password gets sent to the unprotected device in the, in the clear, right? So that's where crypto magic happens. Um, it's really, it's really so-called oblivious to the random function, which means, uh, and you can think of this this way, uh, the oblivious to the random function is a protocol that can be, uh, that accomplishes the following. The client picks some random encryption key. What he sends to the device is not password in the clear, but encrypted password under this one time key chosen by the client. And because of um, homomorphism of cryptographic tools, um, the PRF and this encryption, what comes out is an encryption of the PRF value. So the device is able to compute the PRF over this encrypted plain text without learning the plain text. Okay, that's this sort of crypto magic. And, 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 and then, of course, the client decrypts it and gets the, uh, the proper uh, PRF value, which was this randomized password. Okay? But uh, I will show you in the next slide that the whole magic is really standard stuff. Okay? Um, so, uh, so here is uh, how it's done. I mean, how, here is a particular inefficient instantiation of it. It's in some called random oracle model for hash functions. So um, you can do uh, something that is stronger uh, cryptographically, uh, but yet uh, random hash function model is used in all classical public key instantiations. So, um, so it's, it will be the, uh, that's a secure SPLS uh, session establishment. Okay, so uh, the, the random function is implemented like this: you hash a password over some Diffie-Hellman group, so the same kind of group that a Diffie-Hellman key exchange uh, uses, utilizes, and you exponentiate it to the secret key, which is the secret exponent in the group that the, the device has. So compare it, for example, to RSA signature. The RSA signature is hash of the message onto a group, where it's a different group, it's a group of, uh, you know, Z and star for a composite, uh, you don't have to use composite groups in, in R, but, but the similar math. And then you exponentiate to a private key. Well, that's exactly how the function works. And now look at this. If uh, the client picks uh, this key, one time key that the client picks, it's a random exponent. And what he says to the server is just the hash password exponentiated to this random exponent R. What, this, what the device does is that it takes this encrypted, if you will, a uh, hashed password and exponentiate it to his, to his key, KD. Then the client, in, uh, this is step number four, can de-blind or decrypt uh, this, uh, the device's response B. And what he gets is the function value. And look in the blue square that this is the case, right? Because it's about a, a, a homomorphism of exponentiation. If I hash something, I call it little h, and I raise it to the r, that's what client does, and that's raised to the k, that's what device does, and then it's raised to one over r, that's what the client does in step number four, then these, all these exponentiations can be out, and what remains is the exponentiation to the key. So it's a very simple thing. It was called Blind Dicky Hellman. Uh, David Chow was the first one, I think, who proposed it in 1985 for anonymous uh, uh, cash, I think, uh, and also the anonymous for blind signatures. Uh, this is a trick that was used uh, many times in many cryptographic settings. And and what it does in this application is that the, um, the master password, if you look at the message, what the device sees is hashed password to the random exponent. Well, actually, this is a permutation in the group. 
So this method A is independent of the password. It's information theoretic hidden from the device. Um, and that's why the password, as we say in Sphinx, it, 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 it's the strengthening of password, the translation of a human memorizable password to a completely still random string in a way that hides the password from the service that strengthens it. Um, and uh, so it's so, so the transparent, what it means is can, you can run it over standard password over PLS, or you can do PCI-free uh, password authentication as, as uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, between the client and the service. Okay. Um, so it's not I'm sorry, Stanislaus? Oh, yes. Sorry. Yeah, we got one person typing, so I think we might have a question coming up. Okay. Uh, with our, and, uh, okay. Um, go back to the slide. R and KD must be prime or can be anything prime. Uh, well, no, the modulus is, uh, well, the fastest instantiation would be in prime order group. So there can be, um, you know, if you want to force, if you just have 80-bit security, there will be 160-bit um, prime. Uh, I mean, if, uh, you know, random exponent modulo a prime. 160-bit prime, uh, you should use 320, really. Uh, when you use, okay, so, so a laptop, you don't care because laptop has no secret. Uh, no, R is the one-time one -time secret, so every time you run it, uh, you will use a uh, fresh R. But if you lose your, uh, your cell phone, you are indeed, uh, uh, okay, I wanted to use uh, an impolite word. Well, you will be in trouble. So, um, so uh, what, uh, yeah, yeah, so actually this is where our generalization that comes up uh, is handy. Um, we showed that you could thresholdize this uh, device key so that it is a variable and secret. So loss of a single device is not going to destroy you. Look, this is an authentication system. So if you lose your password because your cell phone drowned and it's not uh, cached anywhere, um, well, you have to reestablish authentication with the services. It's really not the worst thing that can happen in this world, uh, you know. Um, but uh, but um, you know, if your cell phone gets, um, you know, if your child steals your cell phone and takes it in a backpack to school, um, perhaps uh, it's good if you have a backup, and that's what your threshold solutions will show. Yes. So, and of course. You know, there is a KD is what you need to back up if you want to authenticate quickly in the case of loss of device and you're not okay to reestablish all the authentication stuff. Um, and, and we'll show it in a, in a few slides how, how one way to, to, to potentially do it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, so not only secure, but um, and if any uh, questions, please do uh, say. It is uh, very good that you're asking. Um, so, um, so, so single round, this is only one round of communication, and it's fast stuff. So basically, one or two exponentiations is as inexpensive as a TLS establishment. TLS establishment uses two exponentiations per part in basically any, any mode or more if you want uh, password for secrecy. Uh, it's server transparent and, uh, and you can use either personal device or an online service. Uh, so, um, so, okay, so we have all this uh, security uh, uh, you know, properties. There is a little, um, Addendum to the uh, uh, how the, the if if this, the subsequent authentication between sorry between the client and the service is the current password over TLS, then um, the, the client needs to authenticate the device. The client needs to establish uh, devices public keys and just authenticate it at another PKI service. 
so you basically, if the client messes up both the public keys of the server to which it authenticates and the device, then the cloud client exposes itself to the offline dictionary attack, which, by the way, happens now. Okay, or it's worse because if the client messes up uh, service public key, then it ends up sending the password in the clear to the attacker. Um, uh, and you can do better if you replace current uh, password over TLS with uh, cryptographic stakes, uh, whose cost, by the way, is like TLS. Uh, so, uh, to, to, and also we have to, uh, improvement to two factor authentication. Um, that gets uh, stronger security um, in the case of client corruption, and also stronger online security. You know, uh, basically, two-factor authentication should remain secure, even if password is completely gone. I mean, it's basically, password is assumed to be known by the attacker, and yet, uh, using the additional device, uh, you should be able to to, to run securely. Okay. Um, okay. So let's see how uh, this can be uh, distributed to um, uh, for uh, to protect better protect secrecy and availability. So wh what that really shows is, this, is you know what, what this device or service implements. It's a password store, password store, but it's a interactive password store. It's a, um, it's a password store that can be run as a service. So. So how to improve both secrecy and availability of this, of this password store? Well, uh, abstractly, very simply, what we are dealing with is how to protect a secret, uh, when, uh, which is, in this case, basically this uh, POS key that helps you translate from the master secret to all those uh, passwords. When you can remember some single uh, human memorizable string, and, but you don't want to trust anything else, and you don't want to keep other keys. You don't want to rely on security of any keys that would be permanently stored by your by your client and exposed in case the client is attacked. So normally, what we would do is secret share the this um, is encrypt secrets under some key and secret share this key among multiple servers. Okay, so that protects secrecy and availability you know, with a, with a flexible threshold that we can set. Uh, but, but how do you authenticate, right? So you encrypt this, you have this master secret key, and you want to distribute it. But how do you retrieve it to decrypt your secret? So if you have independent passwords with all these sharing servers, there's, it's not realistic. Uh, if you use the same password, well, that's not good because any of them can do a dictionary, offline dictionary attack against you. So what do we will do? Well, we call it password protected secret sharing. Imagine it works like this. You have this secret. Assume these are basically these encrypted passwords. And you are going to store them encrypted and authenticated under this randomized uh, password string, like this PRF on your master password. And in a single server solution, solution this, sorry, the typo is not R, but RWD is the POS on your master password, where K is stored by the single server. But you can thresholdize it. This K can be stored by a group of servers. Uh, think simple math, additive sharing. So K is K1 plus K2 plus blah, 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 KN, all random numbers mod P, mod some prime, a PRF uh, over the password is the same hash individually exponentiated by each server, and then client multiplies it locally, right? So the same stuff works very simply. Um, if you use secret sh Shamir secret sharing in the exponent, you can upgrade it to uh, standard secret sharing property so that you don't have to have all those servers participating suffices to have a threshold structure, right? So um, this gives us um, basically, it also gives the most efficient so-called threshold take. And even though it looks so simple, um, 
well, there is a more complex analysis behind the hood. And um, and if you just focus on the red stuff in red, uh, threshold stakes were shown, you know, were known to be the good tool for protecting against offline dictionary attack to thresholdize what services store, okay? Uh, so the people can authenticate and yet the secrets or hashes of passwords are not stored at any central location. But yet these solutions were multiple rounds, they involved servers talking to each other. What we show that you can do it with a simple call and response and you can do it in a, you know, basically the cheapest thing possible. It's a one expansion per server, two per client. This is less than TLS session uh, calls for, okay? Uh, so I will not uh, uh, talk about this uh, improvement. It's a, it's, a, it's a recent work, you know, just shown how to, how similar kind of stuff can also has the added benefit of um, basically for the first time showing how to efficiently sort password authentication that does not rely on uh, PKI. Okay, that was actually uh, not 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 shown before, and and we we use it with with similar uh, some math that uh, you can. Uh, scrutinize and, and actually uh, the math is not hard. It's, a, it's, a, it's a generally, you know, it's sort of hooked to the previous uh, stuff and sort of uh, bootstraps from that. And, and, um, and, and yeah, it shouldn't be uh, too hard to see how, how that works. Uh, so so, so the, the point is that, that we are uh, privately sorting uh, non-PKI uh, pegs. Um, in summary, uh, password uh, authentication has multiple vulnerability, and it's uh, it's a serious problem that that um, you know we, we were bombarded with the news um, that you know it, most recently it seems to have hijacked our uh, you know a democratic uh, process with the leak of um, information from democratic uh, DNC using a, a very simple human engineering password, apparently somebody sent them a password to a hacker, uh, you know, in the middle of the night, uh, half asleep. Well, there were many people asleep uh, um, in different parts of the system, but, um, but that was one of them. Um, and yet, you know, using simple crypto, uh, password insecurity is not inevitable. Like, it could be strengthened in, in multiple ways on multiple levels. It could be uh, it could be improved. Um, what it needs from a practical point of view for adoption is, is um, well, it's a little code on the browser. So uh, browser extension, uh, not the most, uh, you know, comfortable uh, thing. Uh, perhaps adoption by, uh, you know, perhaps extension to the, that are incorporated to the browser uh, Standard in um, you know TLS or, or you know in its extensions uh, that are um, that are integrated uh, better uh, into the you know the way that 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 the systems are engineered currently. Um, uh, but um, and also our schemes are backed by security proof uh, publications. And it's, uh, you know, uh, mature, efficient, uh, and simple technology uh, uh, that is waiting to be deployed. Um, uh, thank you so much. And uh, please, um, if there are questions, um, happy to hear them. Great. Well, while people are typing, I just want to go over a couple of things. Um, first, uh, thank you, Stanislav, for presenting. And uh, for those of you who are attending uh, today's presentation, please take our survey. I just dragged over a little screen here um, with a hyperlink for, for you to access it. Let us know what you thought of this presentation. And uh, if you have any suggestions for future presentations or if you'd like to request to present, we'd like to hear from you. Um, and uh, so far, we've got a couple of questions here. Um, let me just uh, go through a couple more notes and then we'll then we'll hit them. Um, 
Um, our next presentation is actually going to be uh, this week on Wednesday. We're having a, a one-off that's off our normal schedule. And this topic is an overview of CTSD engagements and the application process with uh, CTSD's uh, PI Von Welch. And so if, if you're at an NSF organization and you would like to have an engagement with CTSD, I highly encourage you to attend this webinar because Vaughn will also be taking questions uh, about applications or the process. And then our next regular webinar, uh, which is the fourth Monday of the month, is going to be September 25th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and that topic is Threat Intelligence Sharing with uh, Romaine Wartell. And so let's go through these questions here. First, we have something from Carl. Uh, any plans or interest in deployment? Oh, very, you know, interest very strong. I would, I would love, I mean, the whole point of this is, uh, you know, it's not to break some feasibility barriers in, uh, in, you know, theoretical cryptography. The point is engineer it so that it is uh, so inexpensive that, and, uh, you know, try to, foresee all the issues that, uh, that, are, that might stop it from deployment and try to heal this uh, so that it could be deployed. Um, but, uh, you know, of course it's, uh, um, well, who Kravchuk has long experience with uh, working with ITF and, uh, and, you know, all sorts of uh, uh, practical projects, uh, you know, he, done amazing work at um, SSL and TLS standardization and uh, also uh, Max team. Um, uh, Nitesh is uh, very much a, you know, a hands-on uh, guy at the University of Alabama. Uh, he uh, prototypes the stuff, he does usability studies. Um, there is, uh, you know, there is strong interest on our side uh, to 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 work with, help, uh, respond to. Um, uh, so so this stuff, uh, you know, hits the street. Um, let me check that website. Uh, uh, that that sound? Uh, yes, yes, this website. I. I didn't look at it myself, what my co-author uh, wrote here at the University of Alabama, but uh, uh, yes, I can see now that I'm actually reusing their graphics. It that sort of went between me, Nitesh, Hugo, back to me, uh, you know. Um, yes, this is that stuff. Uh, um, not, uh, so what I was talking about is joint work with Nitesh, it's a joint work with Hugo, there is mm, not everything overlaps. Uh, so, um, uh, in particular, this, uh, this generalization to secret sharing, uh, Nitesh um, wouldn't have um, probably explanations about how that stuff works. But it's all in our papers, uh, too. And if you just Google like D DBLP uh, directly, then you will have this. That doesn't contain one, can one number, one structure, et cetera. Just eliminate such rules. Uh, uh, um, yeah. So I suppose. Okay. So I, I guess people hear me, so I don't have to type my answers. So yeah, Jim right. asks, uh, what happens? Uh, yeah, when uh, this, these rules say one. Um, you know. So I guess I guess this two random string is going to be encoded into ASCII. And, and now, uh, you know, the browser extension knows what 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 uh, what, what password format the web service uh, expects, so it can code it into because it's just encoding. Well, there is uh, right, so it can code it into any format the, the, the web service expects, and it's a pseudo random string, so it should have uh, all the characters that you want. But it might be longer than, than the, you know, like, uh, yeah, uh, you know, if, if you want to ensure that you're going to hit an exponent, you know, some uh, punctuation mark by just making that string long enough, what might happen is that it's too long. Um, 
Yeah, so this is something I, I, I honestly didn't didn't think about, and uh, uh, there should be some walk around. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, any of these rules is this, it, as long as you describe these rules in a generative way, right? If you describe a way to generate a random uh, password that satisfies the rules, you are done, because all you need is now uh, to map from the random. A string to to feed the generator uh, so that the the generated string is one that fits the rules, right? So as long as the rules can be described in the form of a, a sampling procedure, how to sample from the you know stupid space that this particular website wants, and then we are done. It seems. Expanding on that thought, what if the website requires you to change your password? Will you need a new random? Yes, you would. And uh, you could easily build epochs into the stuff, right? Because it's like you could just um, pretend. You could pretend. You could you put in into the hash a password and a uh, and a, and a um, unique uh, domain name, right? It, so basically, it's as secure as as uh, as um, public key uh, stuff because the public key eventually is hooked onto some unique domain name that the user is supposed to recognize. Um, <clears throat> and now you can also append that with an epoch number. Um, but, but, but then you have to remember the epoch number. So, uh, well, I guess you would have to basically, yeah, so that's a, that's a practical thing, like how do you keep Epoch numbers are divergent because one service asks you to refresh and the other doesn't. So um, yeah, I, uh, I don't know offhand, but I will I will keep thinking about that and and uh, maybe um, get back to you or or if you have an idea, um, you know, uh, do tell me what would be the practical around for this. What's the length of a string? You mean to run? Um, I assume you mean the RWD uh, string, uh, completely variable, because if you, uh, I will uh, just um, uh, zoom down to this slide. Um, wait, uh, this one, sorry to move like this. Yeah, uh, so basically, uh, look, here, the RWD is a group element, right? So it's, um, it could be like a point on an elliptic curve. But uh, like obviously, at this point, you can hash it to whatever you need, right? So you can hash it up. You can expand it using the random number generator, right? The random generator to like you know 1,000 long bit strength if you want, or you can hash it down. Um, so, so you're sort of free to, 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 to hash it up or down. Um, to print whatever um, the server uh, needs. Uh, hold on. Did I miss some questions? Sometimes the random string doesn't contain. Okay. Uh, no, I think so far we're up to we're all up to date on the questions. Zach Zalak is still typing something, so yeah. we'll we'll wait for his response. Um. So so we very much. Um, So I think that uh, Nitesh, who is mostly basically uh, some sort of my students did prototyping with uh, Nitesh at the University of Alabama, and and even like uh, Mali, her the PhD student he has basically was taking uh, charge of it and, and essentially advising uh, my um, master students on 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 this. Uh, and the, whether their prototypes are are available for testing and deployment. I, I I forget if they made their deploy uh, their prototypes uh, um, available. Um, I should know that, and I and I forget what's the status of that. Um, um, if um, if there is a way uh, to, you know, update my slide, I can try to, like, in a, in a matter of day or two, to um, clarify this information and, and post it at the end of the, as the last slide. Um, 
uh, I, I think I'm missing posted, pointer to papers, pointer to web summits, and um, information about um, uh, availability of software. Yeah, if you could give because, me an updated uh, slide or presentation, I'll, yeah. I'll make sure that it gets archived. Yes, so um, thank you. Thank you. So I guess if um, uh, anybody uploads this, uh, anybody about this uh, updated slide to um, they would have this pointer. Uh, what does it make to make this scheme quantum computing resistant? Ha, thank you. Um, well, so basically it uses, um, it really, uh, if you look at the papers, they are kind of written in a very um, abstract way. So we want to, in order to, uh, start getting traction of like to reduce complexity in a security argument, <clears throat> we actually model these things as something called universally composable oblivious pseudonym function. And we're sort of oblivious ourselves in the cryptographic design to what the uh, math underneath this oblivious, how, how these are realized. And there is uh, absolutely no reason why they shouldn't be realized with, um, with um, uh, 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 math coming from, you know, with um, uh, based on learning uh, uh, with noise uh, problems that underlie the, uh, the uh, uh, or, or learning with error problems that that, um, that are uh, you know believed to uh, to be quantum resistant, uh, right? So all the quantum resistant math is basically. Uh, coming from lattice problems, and um, and, uh, uh, and 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 they, they have they have very strong homomorphism. So in fact, on the same lattice problems, on the same kind of class of lattice problems, fully homomorphic encryption is based. So they have you know as much homomorphism as you can possibly wish for. What we need is a much much more primitive form of homomorphism. So you would basically use. Um, less expensive lattices than than the instantiation than fully homomorphic encryption. So um, there's, we haven't done this, but there is like no way this, that this cannot be done with lattices. So basically, it's like for sure can be done with lattices. That's uh, that's what I what I think, and and not very expensive lattices. Oh great. Um, Okay, well, um, I'll just do last call for questions since we're kind of coming at the end of the presentation time. You know, uh, for crypto uh, aware audience that, you know, and Carl, for example, is, uh, this stuff what we do, the math is so similar to just key agreements. Okay, if, if you have Diffie Hellman in some group and you do in elliptic curves, I mean, in, sorry, in other lattices, then, then you get what we are doing. What, what we are doing is, you know, it's, it's basically D.C. Hellman uh, just used to blind and be blind, but it's the same, uh, it's the same math. Okay, sorry, Jeanette. No, that's okay. fine. <laughs> um, okay, well, uh, I don't, I don't think anyone else has any more questions. Um, yeah, please give me an update uh, on contact info so that we can so that people who might want to uh, follow up with you on this project uh, can contact you or, or at least a website that they can uh, defer to. Um, but other than that, I just want to say thank you very much for presenting today. And thank you, everybody, thank you. for attending uh, this, this webinar. And uh, more information about CTSC is communicated on our website, trustedci.org as well as uh, links to our mailing list and uh, archives of previous presentations. So, um, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you yeah, for listening. Thank you. thank you for great questions. Uh, get in touch if you have some ideas for uh, where it should go next. Great. Okay. Uh, so uh, with that, I will stop recording. <laughs>